All right. Well, everybody, thank you for joining us tonight um, here at the uh, um, NATRAC series. Let me get that screen out. Um, this is the Let's Ride seminar series. And tonight we are featuring um, sound competition. So thank you all for joining us and uh, NATRC, thank you for hosting these meetings. So tonight, um, let's meet the panelists. I'm Carrie Riddick. I'm a veterinarian from Region 5, and uh, I've been a veterinary judge for um, just a very short while, but I've been a NATRAC member for about 12 years, um, and I'm located in Georgia. So, Kay? Well, hi. I'm Dr. Kay Gunkel. I'm from Region 3. I started in NATRAC as a child. I did was a junior writer and uh, actually was on NATRAC scholarship and um, then took a hiatus from the sport as I went to vet school and started my own practice and my family and then got back into the sport, um, was blessed to get to compete with my children and my mom competes as well. Um, I've had my judging card for many years now and I'm just blessed that I've got to um, judge all over the country, including Alaska. Um, really enjoyed, uh, I mean, I'm just passionate about the sport and I, I will always be doing competitive trail. Okay, Pam, tell us about you. Okay, my name is Dr. Pam Hess. Some of you who have been in NATRAC for a very long time, first of all, will know that I'm getting pretty old. And I used to compete as Dr. Pam Pinchuk when I lived in Oklahoma and I rode a lot in Texas and Kansas and Arkansas and Oklahoma around there. So I started NATRAC, gosh, in probably 1993 or two, first as a rider and then I quickly became a veterinary judge. And then I moved out of that area and I've lived in Ohio now since, um, well, for about 20 years. Uh, I did get married and I changed my name to Hess and I'm now the veterinary um, co-chair of the judges committee. So I help bring in new veterinarians into the sport and get them trained and get them out uh, working in the field, um, judging new riders. And I, I don't ride very much anymore. I'm more involved um, now in my free time as a carriage driver. So I do a lot of competitive carriage driving when I can. And I'm the Dean of the Equine Program at the School of Equine Studies at Lake Erie College, which is a small private liberal arts college on the shores of Lake Erie in Northern Ohio. So um, many of you, if you know me, you've been riding in NATRAC a long time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, excellent. Well, ladies, I'm just looking forward to a really nice conversation tonight about soundness and, um, you know, just how can we help our competitors um, improve, you know, their conditioning for their horses, specifically on soundness. And uh, Kay, um, would you mind just talking kind of about initially when a competitor starts the day on Friday and you're doing your initial exam, what all is involved? So um, we have here in front of you too the um, scorecard. And so we, with our initial exam, we're trying to get baseline criteria that we can then use throughout the ride to compare how the horse is um, reacting to the competition. And so we start at the top of the card here um, with mucous membranes, capillary refill, um, jugular fill, skin tenting, gut sounds, muscle tone, and then we check their maw or the um, that, uh, movement, attitude, and willingness. Um, you'll notice too that, so there's three sections to the card. So that we'll, first we'll do the metabolics under conditioning, then there's soundness, and then at the bottom is uh, the trail ability and manners. And we, um, because we want a horse that's also well-mannered and easy to um, examine, on the back of the card, we'll, you'll have all those criteria. It'll show the competitor exactly um, what we, you know, so that hopefully all of us are scoring um, very similar so that from one judge to another. Um, but we're also looking at each individual horse and it, comparing it to how it um, changes throughout the ride. 
So Kay, uh, how does the competitor interpret your, the values that you're calling out on the initial exam? Right. And so, you know, we basically use a system anywhere from one to four, usually. Um, and you can see on those sections there. So hopefully at check-in, these horses are coming to us uh, well hydrated. They've hopefully not been too stressed on their trailer ride to the ride. Um, and so hopefully they're starting the ride um, well conditioned, well hydrated. That sounds are moving. Um, they're a healthy horse um, to start the ride. We want to make sure that they're sound enough to start the ride and that, that they're um, able to deal with the, the, the excitement of the ride. Um, that would be that trail manners and ability because sometimes the horse that you unloaded when you get to the ride is not the horse that you um, have to ride at home. Truth. That is so true. Well, thank you. I think that's a really uh, great, great discussion. Um, I just wanted to take a second to talk about why soundness is so important in this sport. On the card, soundness is worth 45 points. Um, it's the, so of the three soundness is the most important and when we're thinking about that we're talking about the legs the horse's back their way of going we're also talking about their trot out so to me when we put this picture together what is so important about this is you know these this is the foundation of the horse this is the horse that's going to be carrying the rider you know, the eight to 10 miles for leisure or, you know, the 20 to 40 or to, you know, 60 to even a 90 miler um, back in the day when we did the three days, it's, you know, and so they've got to have a good confirmation with their legs. They have to have a strong back, their way of going, meaning when they're, you know, it's funny because some competitors will say, hey, they're just moving a little different at the end. And kind of what we'll see is they're, they, they're just not moving the same way they did at the beginning. And sometimes that way of going, it's not just muscle soreness, but it's actually a soundness issue. And so that's something that we can kind of talk about a little bit. And then just the trot out that the um, competitor's doing, the down, the circles, the back, um, even when they're either mounted or if we're doing them in hand, uh, being able to see the horse move and be able to observe soundness um, just gives us an indication that we're gonna have a good strong healthy horse to carry us as far as we're going over those those competitions so pam what do you think can presentation um when a competitor is presenting can their presentation affect what a judge is seeing thanks carrie um presentation is hugely important and those of you that have ridden on me know I can harp on you a lot about how you present your horse. By the way, if any of you have questions while you're going along, there's a Q&A box or a chat box um, on your computer. You may need to go to the bottom of your screen, but um, Sarah is uh, monitoring that and we're happy to take questions um, throughout. So go ahead and type your questions in if you have a question. So um, presentation to the vet judge is your opportunity to show me the vet judge that your horse is sound and ready to compete. And at the end of the ride, you're gonna show me again that your horse completed the ride and is still sound and uh, even fit to continue. So unfortunately, some competitors don't do a very good job of showing their horse to me. And it could be that the horse is sound and should not be faulted in any way for lameness, but because of the way the horse is presented, the horse is made to look lame or uneven in his way of going. So for me, the minimum standard that I wanna see, whether we're talking about the initial vet in on Friday before the ride or the final vet out at the end of the day on Sunday, is I wanna see a trot straight out and then the horse needs to have a loose enough line so I can see his head, but not so loose enough that he practically gets turned around running with you. And then when you get to the spot where we've asked you to lunge or run with the horse, I need to see a horse trot the circle. So remember the circle is that round thing and it has to be round. It has to be the same motion the whole time around in the circle. Uh, I need to see a consistent working gait. I don't really care what that gait is going to be. 
if your horse is an Arabian, he's going to trot. And he may have a slow trot or he could have a trot that might be a little bit too fast and big. We don't want his 12 mile an hour trot. We want about his maybe five mile an hour, six mile an hour trot to see him go in that circle for judging lameness. If you have a fox trotter or a Tennessee walker, we certainly have a lot of those in our sport. Pick his working gait and show me that you've trained the horse to lunge in a circle on that gate and stay in that gate all the way around. So why is that so important? Uh, we wanna see the horse trot in a circle in both directions, to the right and to the left, because the horse will manifest a lameness usually to the leg that is on the inside of a circle. And if the horse, for instance, is, has a really bad sole bruise, when that foot is on the inside of that circle, if the horse is lunging to the right and it's a right foot that is sore, the horse is going to limp more in that direction. So we need to see your horse go in both directions at a consistent circle. So why is it so important to trot in a circle? This subject has come up before the judges committee before. It's come up with a lot of the competitors who perhaps don't want to take the time to lunge their horse or it's a hot day and we're trying to get through, but everybody wants to know why is it so important that we trot in a circle. We're going to assess whether your horse is sound, grade one, grade two, or grade three lame. If the horse is grade three lame, he's not going to be allowed to start. And these grades of lameness are the AAEP, the American Association of Equine Practitioners grades of lameness. And a grade one lameness cannot be seen on a straight, straight away trot out. By definition, a grade one lameness, and it's written right on the back of your horse card, is difficult to observe and is not consistently apparent regardless of circumstances. So if all I do is see you trot out and back, I cannot diagnose a grade one lameness. And that is where we want to start with grade one being worth three to five points and grade two being worth five to ten points. So a grade two lameness is difficult to observe at a walk or trot when trotting in a straight line, but consistently apparent under some circumstances like a circle. So it's hugely important that we see your horse circle in the vet in and then the vet out. So um, one of the problems we have is with horses who don't have a consistent gait. So um, I wanna talk a little bit about the right way to show your horse to the vet judge um, about um, a straight trotting horse and then uh, whether it's a fox trotter or a gated horse or a Pasifino or whatever. So here's my big pet peeves about um, what not to do when you're vetting your horse in. Carrie, I think you have some other slides on um, what, can, what we're looking for with presentation. So um, one big thing that you can do to help your horse at presentation is keep your consistent speed. Don't start and stop. In some of these, the horse trots a little bit and then he stops. And so you encourage him along and then he starts again. And when they do that, they kind of lunge forward and then they settle into a slower gait and then that makes the horse look lame. The horse is not lame, but he's being made to look so because of the inconsistent speed that he's trotting. So the start and stop, that's problem number one. Problem number two is the box. Many of you have probably seen, remember the circle is the round thing. If you present your horse in the box, the box is a square thing. And so what you do is you send your horse out on the lunge line and he goes in a straight line. And then you say, oh, he's not in a circle. So you pull him in and then he goes in a straight line and then you pull him in again. And pretty soon you've trotted your horse in a rectangle. And when you've done that, every time you pull that horse's head in, it makes him look lame. It makes him lift up his shoulder on the opposite side, drop his shoulder on the side that you pulled him in towards, and then you have to encourage him and he lifts up and he looks lame. The horse may not be lame, but remember your job as a competitor is to show me the sound horse that you have. And by incorrect showing him to us, you've made the horse look lame. Okay, so I've saved my favorite for last. You've got a picture of a pacing horse there on your presentation slide. Whether it's a pacing horse, a fox trotter, a Tennessee walker, don't do what I call the fox elope. So you get your horse out there on the lunge line, 
And I know a lot of you think that we veterinarians cannot judge a, a, a gated horse, but we have to have your cooperation and good presentation. So you get your horse out there and he starts doing a pace. The pace is sort of a default gait to a lot of horses. When they get discombobulated in their legs, they may fall into a pace, even though it might be a tendency walking horse. So you get after the horse because you know he's not supposed to pace. And then he starts to lope. And then you try to slow him down a little bit. And then he's fox trotting in front and he's loping behind. And before you know it, you've trotted a circle or two and you've shown me four different gates in that horse all in one presentation. I cannot possibly judge the horse that way. So just remember your job is to show your horse in an even speed at a working gait, we'll tell you if it's too fast or too slow, you want to make that horse look as good as you can, as sound as you can. If I think you're cheating in how you do it, and I can tell you some stories about that, um, we'll figure that out. That's our job as veterinarians to be on top of this. But your job is to get that horse to go a consistent speed, the same gait, all the way around a circle, both directions. All right. What's next, Carrie? Excellent. So, and there's, I should say thank you to so many competitors that have helped me get some nice videos in. Um, Sarah will have this uh, PowerPoint presentation and anybody can have access to it and be able to see um, a lot of these presentations um, of circles and large circles, like this is an Arabian right here with a large circle. And then the next video will be one uh, of a smaller circle. And it's really interesting because um, the horse, the way of going is so different. Um, he looks off in the small circles and is very beautiful, nice moving in the large circle. So those will be some good demonstrations for everybody. So yeah, yeah. That's why we I usually, have some comments we usually have dictate the size of the circle that we want the horses to go on. Most veterinarians at a ride will set some cones out or some rocks out or something, and we'll tell you the size circle that we want you to try. And it's not going to be a hundred meter circle. It's going to be like a 30 meter circle. <laughs> that's right. So Kay, what were you adding? What are you adding? Well, I just wanted to add as a competitor myself that has competed on both the uh, um, trotting horse and a uh, gated horse that um, I truly believe it's harder to present a gated horse because they have so many gates that they want to try to do. So I actually taught my gated horse to trot in hand and that definitely helped. Um, as a judge, I've seen lots of people with gated horses actually running their circles in order to, tr to better able to keep that horse in the gate that they want him to present in. Um, I just truly believe the Arabian, well, I have an Arabian, um, is just very easy to, much easier to present. So um, there's a lot of breed differences and different ways that a competitor can then present their horse to the vet judge. I will take a second to talk about running with the horse. Thank you for bringing that up, Kay. Um, some of our horses don't know how to lunge. Uh, I agree with Kay, by the way. I think that um, pretty much any horse, uh, all of these gated horses can be taught to straight trot on a lunge line, and then you'll get your vet in and out done really easily. But for those of you who have chosen not to teach your horse to lunge and who want to run with the horse, this is the more difficult way, and you're going to have to run. The problem is, particularly when you are on the inside of the circle, it's very hard for you to run fast enough to get that horse to um, to show his gait properly. So most of the time the competitor is trying to run and the horse is walking behind you. So uh, I think that 90% um, of the time your horses will show better if you lunge them. But if you want to run with them, you need to practice it and you need to be able to run smoothly, evenly and quickly with them. Yeah. Those are very excellent points as well. And I think something that our competitors really do run into trouble with. Um, so I think those are very valuable points. Uh, Kay, would you like to please just kind of discuss forelimb lameness and what is it that we're looking for when we're looking at a forelimb lameness? Yes, um, so as the slide kind of describes, um, the, the big thing that we're watching for is a head bob. 
And so that's why it's so important that as you're trotting the horse out, that you're um, giving enough line so that we can observe that head bob. And um, the horsemanship judges have been very helpful with um, trying to educate um, the, the competitor to make sure that that happens. So, you know, as the affected limb hits the ground, the head comes up and it may be pretty marked with the more severe lamenesses or very minor, minor with just like a grade one. Um, it does also, uh, can be exaggerated as the affected leg is on the inside of the circle. But sometimes we'll see a shortening of the stride when the affected leg is on the outside of the circle. And hopefully those are things that competitors can see as they watch these videos. I think these videos can be very um, helpful. And then I also recommend that if you get to a ride, take the time to go up and watch people um, present their horses because not only is that good practice for helping you to present your horse but it's also just a really good idea to watch different horses and see if you can see a lameness or um, a, a different way of going on that horse that's excellent and you know i really also think that when you get used to seeing unfortunately a few lamenesses then when you're you know just screening your horse at home it can start to train your eye to your horse's movement so then you know if before you even load them on the trailer if they're looking freely moving and sound or you know a little off and you know be able to help yourself yeah i think um, this there's a lot of competitors that um, have shared with me that I, I just, I just can't, I can't feel it. I can't see it. Um, and I think that just like learning to listen with a stethoscope on knowing what your horse's normals are, it's important to, to learn your horse's way of going so you can tell if there's a problem down the, down the road. Yeah, that's an excellent pearl there. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and this is a video um, that will be embedded uh, to be able to see, and this is a four limb lameness. So I'm just gonna take a second to kind of talk about hind limb lameness. Um, this definitely seems to be a little bit more tricky to spot. Um, when we're looking for a rear a hind limb lameness, uh, the first thing we're kind of able to see is when the horse is moving away from us, um, there's, if they are off, you're going to see kind of, we call it a hip hike. And so the easiest way to see this would be to put a piece of tape on the um, pin bones of the horse uh, and then be able to watch the tape and see if it's moving evenly. But unfortunately, I don't think competitors would like for us to do that. So <laughs> we're having to really watch closely um, for that hip hike as a horse is trotting away. Uh, this to me is, uh, I personally like to have a little bit of a distance and uh, for competitors to run because frankly the first couple steps that they take, uh, it takes this horse a second to get going. I want to make sure I'm right behind the horse uh, as they're moving on and uh, then let them have a few strides to be able to have that, uh, see if we're having a hip hike or not. Um, it can be a little tricky, especially in, uh, you know, our uneven terrains sometimes that we're asking competitors to uh, trot and gate down and back on. You know, I think the reality is, is it, that's when every horse is in the same situation because they're all having to compensate for the same terrain, realistically. Uh, the other thing that we can see on um, this is when we're doing the circles, we're going to see an uneven foot placement. And so that's something when we're kind of watching the circle, um, you know, part of what we also, the feet are placing and are they taking equal strides um, on both, you know, when they're going in both directions on the circles. And often if they're having a rear limb lameness, they're going to have a shortened step. Um, pretty much with as the rear limb lameness gets worse, they will start really hiking or not wanting to move out at all 
on a circle, especially the inside leg, because that's such a balancing leg that they're having to, um, to use. Uh, the YouTube video is showing a um, horse that is uh, lame. I believe it's in the right rear, but it'll be a good good guess um, to see. And I encourage everybody to to watch that. Um, anything to add, Kay or Pam? I was just going to say that a lot of times on these gated horses, when they have a like a stifle issue, um, they tend to go ahead and break into the canter or that or the buffalo um, because of the pain that that's uh, so if you have a horse that you're observing for lameness and they keep breaking into that buffalo um, it's they maybe they may be lame maybe yeah excellent it's a little easier sometimes to move out of that that regular metered gate so you know, oh, and I think we have a question. Um, Kristen has asked, how do you differentiate uneven foot striding from a horse that just isn't maintaining the same pace? Uh, that's a great question. And sometimes we can't. Um, I think a lot of it is about consistency. So if you have a horse that is in a consistent gait, then that gives us a better chance to be able to see if they're having uneven foot striding and you know we're kind of comparing the front limbs to the front limbs and the arc of their foot placement their arc of their foot plate you know on their rear um versus the you know if they're changing gates you know if they're going from a trot to a you know a canner to a fox lope to a pace i mean we're get we're really getting distracted by the changes of the gait and it, it's usually kind of an assessment of can we try that again please because at least for my own self, I'm having difficulty assessing, you know, soundness on your, on your animal. Um, Pam, Kay? No, I'll comment on that, Carrie. Um, I would agree with everything you said about that. And it just goes to the importance of the good check-in exam and good consistency of pace. I will stop a competitor and, and tell them to, okay, start over, see if you can get them to trot. Or if the horse really wants to pace, see if you can get him to pace. And if we just can't do it, and, and my suspicion is that the horse really is lame, I have to be pretty assured before I will call that horse lame at check-in or at check-out. Um, if I'm not certain, sometimes what I'll do is I'll tell my secretary to make a note, not on the horse's card, but sometimes I will write it on the card or at least on our note page, and I'll say, watch left front or watch right hind. And I will watch this horse. We're fortunate that we get to watch these horses over the course of the weekend and see if the horse really is lame. But typically, if the competitor can, can do a good job in getting the horse straightened out um, and get a consistent speed and can dis consistent gait, I may ask you to make an extra circle or two in each direction. That's okay. I have no problem with that. And um, hopefully, the competitors don't either and will be able to make an assessment. Yeah, I am um, at times, you know, especially on check-in, if I see a horse that I'm concerned about its way of going or a, a potential lameness, I'll ask the competitor, oh, how long has it been? Have you been in camp? Did you warm the horse up? And I'm pretty lean in that if I'm worried about something, I'll ask them to go and warm them up more and bring them back um, just so I have a, a better idea of how well that horse is going to do on this ride. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. And I, and I think everybody needs to, you know, recognize too that we are, you know, yes, there's, I mean, there's a point where we are judging, but we're always trying to, um, you know, we're, we're champions for your horse. We want your horse to do great. We want your horse to be sound. We cheer for the, for, for these guys. Um, and we also take it very seriously because, if we can help make sure your a decision is made before an injury happens, you know, we want to be part of that team, um, you know, just to, so you have your competitor for a long, long time. And so kind of just to lead into that, um, Pam, if, if a competitor is having some concerns about lameness or being told their horse is lame, when, when do we become concerned about the lameness? 
Okay, well, this can happen at any time during the ride. It can happen at check-in. It can happen Saturday night on a trailer check. Um, any time when the horse begins to develop some lameness. Grade one lameness is I'm not terribly concerned about. It's the grade two or grade, thing, grade three lamenesses that get me more concerned. Um, we'll recall that your veterinarian on the ride is not diagnosing your horse and doing a, a full medical exam. But if we see something that is of immediate concern, you can be sure that we're gonna tell you that. We're not gonna keep any secrets from you about your horse. But some of these lamenesses cannot be figured out on a cursory exam. But if your horse is um, thought to be previously sound and he's grade two or grade three lame, certainly I think most of us veterinary judges will spend an extra couple of minutes on that horse. Sometimes I'll ask a competitor to come back after we've gotten through this line of horses and then I'll spend a little bit more time with you on your horse. Um, and then we'll put our hands on it. Feel for heat, pain, swelling, particularly over a joint or over a tendon or ligament. One of the worst things that we could do would be to allow you to take a horse who is grade two lame out on the trail when we can feel a swollen tendon on the horse's leg. If a horse is developing tendonitis, uh, those are the early stages of what you would know as a bowed tendon, going out on that trail is gonna be very damaging to that horse. So we're gonna put our hands on it and. A lot of the times we're not, not gonna feel anything in particular. It could be arthritis that is bothering your horse and there's not gonna be any swelling or noticeable, palpable, visible structure on the horse that is abnormal. But we're gonna check for those things. We're gonna make sure that there is no um, rock in the foot or swelling of a tendon or ligament. Um, Sometimes I'll ask a competitor who's been riding all throughout the summer, have you ever noticed this horse to be lame? Has he ever been called lame before? And then the competitor often will say, yeah, they, they had him grade two at the ride three weeks ago. And then earlier in the summer, they had him grade one or grade two at this ride or that ride. So when you're having these repeated occurrences of mild lameness, that is a, a warning sign to you that you need to, when you get home, you need to call your local veterinarian out and have him examine that horse for you. Um, one of the worst things that you could do, and it's gonna make it more difficult for you to get your horse accurately worked up, don't wait two weeks after the ride and then ask your local veterinarian to come out and look at the horse and tell you why the horse was lame two weeks ago at the ride site. Um, when you get home and that horse is lame, call up and get an appointment right away, it's particularly if it's been consistent or it's grade two or higher. And get your veterinarian out there to look at the horse when the horse is lame, not after the horse has recovered from the lameness. Um, so um, anytime a horse is significantly lame, we want to be concerned about it. it. Oftentimes there's nothing you need to do at the ride site. Occasionally, there will be something that the veterinarian at the ride will say, well, why don't you do this? I've had, I've had a horse founder at a ride site. Uh, I had a horse one time years ago. I've never forgotten that horse. Um, got loose during the night, broke into the trailer where the grain was kept, and oh. ate a whole bunch of grain overnight. And um, we kind of stopped everything on that horse and stood him in the creek all day, and the horse badly foundered. Um, so some things you just can't ignore and need immediate treatment. Other things can wait until you get home and then you pursue them there. Yeah, I had a competitor one time at the ride that just got a, a minor abrasion, but it was right at the coronary band. And luckily that rider was like, you know what? I'm not gonna risk it. And he ended up getting a full blown abscess because of that, just this little puncture wound at the ride. Yep. Wow. They can just be so sensitive, but that's a great description of, of when we should be concerned. And if anybody has any questions about that, again, just message us. We're happy to answer them, even if it's something specific to your own horse. So can we, con can we condition to prevent lameness? Um, I'm just gonna take a second to talk about this one uh, because I believe we can. Um, I, I think there's a big difference between the horse that has ridden 
uh, been properly conditioned um, to be strengthened uh, versus the horse that has been casually ridden and then just shows up for competition. And we're hoping, you know, on just grand emotion, we're going to be ready to go. Um, so first, you know, it, it goes, so much is to be said by finding the horse that is confirmationally sound. Um, you know, if, if we're starting with something, if we're starting with uh, legs that you know, already know that the horse is going to, you know, knock their fetlocks together uh, because they paddle terribly. Um, if we have, you know, something wrong with the back, if it's very obviously uneven, if they're obviously sway back, you're going to have some challenges. It doesn't mean that your horse isn't going to be able to you know, compete in NATRAC and even do very well in NATRAC, but just you're setting yourself up for having some ob obstacles immediately that you're going to have to work with. So try for confirmationally sound, and then let's focus on conditioning. So when we are doing conditioning, um, we always talk about, you know, kind of the LSD training, the long, you know, the long, slow distance training. And there really is a lot to it, um, especially if you're starting a young horse. Um, you know, I've personally have not been competing for the last two years, um, which, you know, ultimately I was able to get my judges card during this time. Um, but the reason is, is I've been starting a young horse. I've, uh, he's six now and we're hopefully going to be getting going pretty soon. But, you know, as he started, he was too young. Everything was too soft and he needed some time and training to develop. So young horses, I think the LSD training is huge on. I think horses that are coming back from injury, the LSD training, just start over like you have a young horse, is also the same thing. It's just huge. Um, what happens with this is you're taking slow miles, you're walking, it's boring, but you're walking, um, and you're increasing your mileage. Then as your horse is you know, showing fitness there, then you can start to add in some speed, then you add in a little bit more distance and you know you can definitely go on the net you can talk to um other natrack competitors you can talk to us about you know where what is going to be too much what parameters do you want to look for on your horse i think every time you get off your horse um you need to just go ahead and feel their back feel their legs um anybody can palpate these their backs anybody can palpate legs if you're feeling the legs you want to make sure that the legs um, feel even all the way across all four legs. There's not any additional swelling present. Um, there's not heat present. Um, you know, if you pick their leg up and just kind of run your hands down, um, where their tendons are, you may not be feeling their superficial and deep flexor tendons, but you can at least learn what your horse's reaction is. And normally they should have no reaction. Um, but if then suddenly you see your horse has a reaction, okay, that's a clue that maybe there's something going on. Um, same thing with backs. You know, if you're feeling backs and, you know, your horse is not reactive, then you should be building a good, strong back. If, you know, they're a little sensitive, a little ouchy, a little, you know, girthy, then, you know, maybe you've got some issues there um, that you need to start working through. Um, these can be little clues that can save you from a big injury later on down the road. So the thing is, is when you start conditioning horses, the first thing that's going to happen is you're going to start to see, of course, all the metabolic things that, you know, the fitness, the respirations, they're not sweating so much. You see that initially, but then we're going to start to see them become a little bit stronger. They're start, going to start to get their wind, you know, their, their endurance. They're going to start to build their muscle. So great. That's happening. As you continue, then you're going to start to have your tendons and ligaments become strengthened. And that's when we're talking about bowed tendons, when we're talking about fetlock issues, um, you know, even some stifle issues. I think if you've been doing some hill work, you've got great chances of building up that rear end and avoiding some stifle issues. And that's not going to be the case for everybody. Um, but you're going to strengthen these tendons, you're going to strengthen leg ligaments, and you're going to, you know, make them less prone to being, you know, so susceptible to injury, especially if you overdo it on your training or just overdo it at a NATRAC ride. So, and finally, 
as we've conditioned and trained, then we start to get some real strong bone density. And that's kind of one of the last things that happens with these horses. But I mean, you start to get these bone dense, tough, strong horses. Um, and those are the machines that go through that. You're just like, that horse is amazing. It, it handles all these conditions. Um, but that's because its body over slow distance, long distance training has, uh, has just become hardened and it's pretty incredible to see. Um, so anyway, that's kind of my take. Okay, Pam, do you have anything to add to that? Well, I was just going to say that um, as we compete with the same horse from year to year, um, you know, they maintain a lot of that conditioning. And so getting that same horse um, ready for the next year of competition isn't going to take as long because we have those um, uh, stronger bones, the tendons and ligaments. I mean, yes, they can injure them, but they, they are starting with a better base. Yes, I 100% agree with that. I would just throw in a little bit here about riding with heart rate monitors. They have gotten better and better over the years. They've gotten less expensive, although you can spend a lot of money on a very high-end model. Some people, especially those of you that really like technical appliances and like to have techie things, you may really get a lot of enjoyment and it can really improve your conditioning through the use of the heart rate monitor. You, it's so helpful to know that over a certain course of ground, over a certain speed, what your horse's normal heart rate is. You want to be able to work your horse at a heart rate of around 100. If you're working your horse um, uphill or in the heat and his heart rate goes up to 140, that is overworking your horse. You get to kind of know what kind of horse, um, what kind of speed and terrain your horse can operate at, uh, at a normal working heart rate. And then you can even get an idea when your horse is beginning to not feel well or experience leanness because his heart rate will tell you even while you're still riding the horse you don't even have to wait for the veterinarian to um, get a PNR on your horse uh, but when you ride with a heart rate monitor um, for your training rides it can be very very helpful for you mm -hmm. that's an excellent point thank you so much so <clears throat> the Kay, I believe we're going to have, um, I would think you would like to discuss the uh, post-ride care to prevent lameness and uh, just share your thoughts on, on that both during competition and then after competition. Yes. Um, one of the things that I um, over the years have um, done for competitors is gone around and done tra uh, Saturday night trailer checks, which the competitors really like. Um, and I don't, want to be out there standing out there in that field anyway. Um, but what I'm finding is that those horses, a lot of times the competitors are just tying them to the trailer. And so then by the time you come around to do trailer checks, those horses are getting a lot more fill and stuff. And so that's why I think during the competition, it's just so important to remember to get up and walk the horse. I mean, there's a, a fine line of allowing the horse to rest and get stuff to eat, but then still taking them out for short walks to you know, just keep that circulation going. We definitely can put cold water on them. And, you know, I um, just taken a uh, bucket with a sponge and just kept sponging the legs. Um, horses get very used to that with time. And then now we do permit the uh, ice boots. And I think we even have a slide or uh, about the different kinds of ice boots that are available. Um, there's several different kinds of them that are uh, can be used, and there's a couple that are not legal. Um, if they're a circulating um, ice boot, that's not legal, or if it's applying pressure, that's not a legal um, ice boot. There we go. So the ones down here on the bottom are the ones that aren't allowed with the pressure applied or if it's circulating ice. Um, but the good old just standing them in the river if there's a river or a creek at the ride that's a great way of just getting them in the river and letting them stand there you can soak them in the um, bucket you can train your horse to do that boy that horse is really good he's got both front feet in the bucket usually i did it one at a time but there's lots of good ice boots out there and you don't have to have a freezer in your um 
trailer to keep those cold. Um, a lot of them are designed where you can just dunk, dunk them in the water and they'll, um, they'll turn to a cold therapy enough to, for the help the horse after the ride. And we can do that each night of the ride. And it kind of varies on um, veterinary judges on when they want the horses iced or not iced, you know, based on when they're going to be checking them. So you'll just have to touch base with your um, vet judge, ask them at briefing what their um, likes and dislikes are with that. After the ride, like after you've been checked out, then there's lots of things that we can do. We can apply a poultice, we can wrap the legs. Um, uh, some of the competitors that are really going to be competing throughout the ride, they want to make sure that these horses stay sound throughout the whole ride season. And so they're going to take the time to wrap the legs with a poultice. Um, we can do some body work, you know, doing some massage and making sure that we're stretching and um, keeping these horses um, moving and not just keeping them tied to the trailer. There's things like acupuncture. Now we have special magnetic blankets. So there's all different forms of things that we can do um, to help our horses after we've asked them to do this competition through the weekend, just like us, they're going to get stiff, like we're going to get stiff and sore, they can get stiff and sore as well. And there's some kind of basic guidelines. I like the, um, the basic guideline for every 10 miles that you do compete at on a ride, that you give that horse that many days off of rest. Now, that may be, you may still um, do stuff with the horse during those, you know, so you do a, a 50 mile ride, you're gonna give five days off. Now you may end up doing things with the horse. You may do some groundwork, you may do some um, obstacles, um, but not putting a lot of miles and stress on those, on those rest days, giving them time to recuperate before we ask them to do more work. Yep, I totally agree with that. I know my competition horses, they they were always so happy to get off the trailer and then just get turned out and they did not want to see me for a day or two. <laughs> um, there, there was a question asked, um, has that been answered? It was a question um, about, uh, Pam, this was for you, I believe, about brands of heart rate monitors. Do you have any specific brands? Right. Um, Kristen asked about um, what kind of heart rate monitor I like. Um, when I was riding and using them, I used a Polar heart rate monitor. That's probably the most common brand out there that's used for this. There are a few other brands. And uh, if you look to especially some of the endurance sites, um, you can find a lot of good recommendations about those. Um, they're very easy to use. They're less expensive than they used to be for the basic model. And uh, I think it adds a lot of fun and, and another, um, another added level of engagement to your training, not, not just the competitions. Excellent. Thank you. I really like to use the heart rate monitors, especially early in the spring when I'm starting conditioning, because it helps me to determine how conditioned the horse is from the get go and how much work I have to need to do or how much we're not worth doing okay. Yeah, totally fair. Totally fair. So, just real quick, um, you know, add on to uh, Kay's you know, give them, you know, days off. Yes, absolutely. Final post ride care, rest and recovery. Um, your horses earn that time. A lot of times, you know, just through strong, healthy horses, um, they're going to have a lot of micro tears, you know, micro tears in their muscle. Um, you know, sometimes you got to break down a little muscle to build muscle. And, uh, and, and so this time of rest and recovery is allowing all of, all of that small damage to heal and develop into stronger muscle, stronger tendons, stronger ligaments. Um, I think this is an important time to add your veterinarian into, um, into the mix with this, you know, your veterinarian, your nutritionist, your farrier, um, that, that kind of, of grouping can be very helpful to uh, make sure that your horse is recovering correctly. And then as they're having changes, you know, decide with your veterinarian, you know, do you need to have, you know, your horse on joint supplement? Um, 
if so, what what can they uh, what can they be on? What does your veterinarian recommend? Always go over to uh, the drug appendice to make sure that what they're suggesting is allowable within Natrac competition. Um, but I think those are some things that we can make sure uh, your horse is is just being comfortable and recovering. Um, so, oh, excellent. Uh, Carolyn has a question. Uh, any suggestions? Kay, this sounds like a, a great question for you to answer. Any suggestions for conditioning for flatlander horses to prepare for mountain rides? Mm. See, and I live in the mountains, so we ride in the mountains all the time. Um, and some of it is, I think we've seen some of our like, region six people come to our region three rides and the horses have actually done very well, even though they've been conditioned on flat ground. So uh, yes, there's um, you know some stress to the lungs and to the heart, climbing up a hill. Um, the basic um, soundness, I think, yeah, as long as you're conditioning, um, getting these horses in condition, even flat land horses can do well in the mountains. Did that answer the question? I think so. The um, definitely. It, I think the other thing that can be helpful is um, is doing some sprint training, you know, um, just because sprint training or anything else that's a little bit different than just our regular mileage conditioning that's going to um, get their heart rate up, going to stress them, and then be able to come, come back down. So I think sometimes wind sprints can be can be good. Um, a lot of it's about recovery and building endurance. I know a few um, Nate Track members have done jumping with their horses, um, just as that builds up some different athletic, some different muscles, different athleticism. Uh, Pam, any suggestions? Yeah, I agree with the sprint training, Carrie. Um, some people would um, call that formal <laughs> interval training. And what you want to do is to add in um, short intervals to start of higher speed, higher exertion work. So if your normal trotting mileage is done at a four to seven mile an hour trot, um, at a certain point where you're comfortable with the footing and let's say you're just riding on the flat because that's what this rider asked about. And um, you want to canter your horse. You want to let them get a good burst of speed. Make sure that you're comfortable, you know where you're going, you're, you're not going to be stepping in gopher holes or anything. Um, but you want to um, give a good hand gallop, give a canter. Do that for 30 to 60 seconds. Um, that seems like a long time when you're doing it and you can cover a lot of territory. And then drop back down to the trot and let your horse recover. Those intervals should be one quarter uh, at the most of the length of your long, slow distances. So in other words, if your uh, long, slow distance work is for 30 minutes, you want your interval training just to be for a couple of minutes, not any longer than that. And the idea is not to really tire the horse out badly, but to stress the horse a little bit for cardiovascular fitness to help develop. And then you go back to your working trot. Don't drop to a walk. Go back to your working trot. Let the horse recover at the working trot. And then maybe 15, 20 minutes later, have another interval of fast canter work. Uh, and the horses love this. It helps overcome the boredom of the trail work and it will help with cardiovascular fitness. Excellent. Thank you. So ladies, this, uh, this has been a really good time. Um, I think we're, we're pretty close on time. Um, so one, let me move my uh, Q and A box here. So this, um, uh, First, we want to again say thank you to Natrack for hosting this event and webinar. Um, we have all of our emails uh, addresses listed right there for uh, Pam, Kay, and myself. So if you have questions, again, um, I want to just thank so many people that helped me get these videos together. They're embedded. I hope you get to see the PowerPoint and, and use them. Um, and then just email us with what questions you have. Um, I think we'll be on here for just another couple minutes if anybody has any questions. Um, Pam, Kay, do you have any final comments? 
just what I was just going to say questions? too that if I was just going to say too, um, I don't mind questions other than lameness too. So if you want to ask about, I don't know, um, vaccines or worming or electrolytes, beet pulp, whatever, feel free to just throw those questions at us. Good deal. And Pam? Well, I see we have a question from Kim. Kim is asking, I'm starting trail riding after a long absence. My new horse is a nine-year-old quarter horse with no conditioning. I rode Arabs in the past. What can I breed? Uh, what can I do differently to help him get started compared to the Arab breed? So, um, Kim, I would say that to begin with, this depends on a little bit of what sort of style and physicality your quarter horse is. You may have noticed that there's not a whole lot of quarter horses in distance sports. Um, but quarter horses can be very successful, but I think you need to little, work a little harder with them. A lot of quarter horses have um, a bulky, heavier musculature and perhaps not as good support um, from the knees down. So you have to be really careful conditioning this horse to make sure that he is ready to go the distance. Um, if you, uh, you're used to riding Arabs in the past, this horse will require more work from you. He may not have the natural physicality to do the distance with the easy physical fitness that your Arabians have found. So you're probably gonna to have to put in longer, slower miles on this horse uh, to get him fit for the work. Kay, any other comments or Carrie about that? I totally agree with your comments and I've seen people out there with their quarter horses um, and when the ones that have done well in our sport talking to the rider they're riding a lot more hours than I'm having to ride you know conditioning a Arabian or half Arab mm -hmm. but it yep. can be done definitely can be done and uh, I think with quarter horses just you know we know that they tend to um, get a little heavy on accident, um, you know, so I think really just paying atten attention to the, um, really paying attention to your nutrition with them, you know, make sure they're on an appropriate diet where they're getting the appropriate calories, the appropriate nutrients. Um, they need to be on some good quality forage, but you don't want them, you know, likely you don't want them just grazing on the lush green pasture um, because you're going to, then be battling conditioning with also trying to maintain proper weight and fitness. And that can just, that can just set you up for frustration because you're working so hard and you're, and you're not getting anywhere. Um, so I think nutrition's a big thing with quarter horses as well. So, oh, so sorry, um, my dog. So, uh, so electrolytes. Um, Kay, would you like to talk about electrolyte use? Kristen's asked about using electrolytes. Should we use them? Yes, I feel like electrolytes are so important. Um, just like for our nutrition, we need to make sure that we are out there on the trail, you know, making sure that we've got our electrolytes. I tell people that electrolytes are kind of like having the oil in your car. In your car, if you don't make sure that they're you've topped off your oil before you go for a long uh, car trip, the same thing. You want those horses starting the ride uh, properly level with proper levels of electrolytes. And then throughout the ride, especially if there's heat and humidity, you're really pushing that horse, they're gonna lose electrolytes during the ride. And I do feel like it is very important that we supply, we supplement our horses with those. Not all electrolytes are created to equal, so it's very important that you just don't go down to the feed store and buy the one that's cheapest on the shelf. Um, and that in itself is a whole discussion too. So, but yes, I do believe that electrolytes are very important. And I'll be glad to, you know, that might be a good one to, you know, email back and forth about um, different forms of electrolytes and which one might work best for your particular horse. I will add in there that uh, I don't think that you should be putting electrolytes in the horse's water. Um, it, drinking water is critically important to a horse that's being fed electrolytes. And uh, 
if I have a choice and I can't get the electrolytes into the horse um, in the water, it's more important to me that the horse drink the water. So I prefer to dose the electrolytes with a dosing syringe or in the grain is how we would have to do it during an A-track ride because um, we don't dose the horses um, in the mouth a lot. Um, but you can do that in a small amount of grain. But uh, I think that if the horse is not drinking water, you need to be a little cautious about continually putting electrolytes into a horse, particularly if it is um, extremely hot and humid and the horse won't drink. That's the horse that is coming to the point that it's gonna need um, a veterinary exam or at least call it to the attention of the veterinarian on the ride uh, if your horse is depressed and won't drink at all. Don't just keep giving them electrolytes. And the horse should always have fresh water, unadulterated with any medication or salts in it um, so he can drink that clean water. Yeah. So then Kristen asked about um, hanging a salt block at the trailer. Is that enough or is dosing better? And Kay's already addressed the question of electrolyte gels and those kinds of competitions and you can email her about that. Um, if your horse is used to having a salt block um, at home, by all means, you can hang a salt block at the trailer. It's not gonna make up for the salt losses during a ride. And most horses um, usually need a combination of sodium and chloride, calcium and magnesium in their electrolytes in their electrolyte mix during competition. Excellent. Great answers. And uh, well, electrolytes are gonna really vary between you know, different breeds even, you know, an Arabian may not need um, the same amount and frequency of electrolytes that a big heavier muscle, um, even Tennessee Walker might. Yeah. And I think the, the one take home point is if you're gonna start using electrolytes in your horse, start using them on your conditioning rides and at home. Don't just come to the ride and then suddenly give them electrolytes that they've never had um, because then they may not eat as well. They may not drink as well. Um, and that's, that's not the time to make that change. Um, you know, if they feel differently, they may, they may not behave the same as what you're used to. So um, make those changes at home and acclimate your horse and then, um, you know, bring, bring your horse to shine at these competitions and uh, know that we're here to help. Um, so ladies, this has been a blast. I have enjoyed it so much. Um, and uh, do you have anything else to add before we go? Thank you so much, Carrie, for all the work you've done for this and for Sarah, who's working in the background to moderate this and handle the questions. And uh, Kay and Carrie, it's been great um, doing this webinar with you. Yes, thank you for asking me to be part of it. Excellent. Well, thank you. It has been fun. I have learned a lot as well. I look forward to being able to see everybody out there on the trails. Um, and I just hope everybody has, uh, and Sarah, uh, Sarah Rennie, thank you. Uh, amazing job of hosting, um, as always. Uh, to all you NATRAC competitors and new people, we will see you soon. And I hope you have a great night. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Night all. Bye-bye.